obligations that seem heavy and you squeak out that little extra to give as an offering. You come in and you put that offering in, you're saying, take that devil. These are real things. This is not just uh, imagery, but in reality, in the kingdom of God, our tithes and our offerings are an attack against the works of the enemy. Can you say amen? amen? Father, we thank you and praise you. We can plant in good ground. We know the harvest coming is well-pleasing to you. We salt our offerings to remind us, according to your word, that all that we bring into the kingdom is well-preserved. And God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. Yeah, turn it down. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What a great day this is to be in the house of God. Are you excited to be here today? If you're joining us on Facebook, uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. If you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, good. You know, that's a good thing to be doing. The word of God that is for this moment is for your moment. And your moment might be the day that I'm bringing the message, but your moment could be three years from now. And you're just tuning into this and, and you're listening to it. It is a word in due season for you. It is a word in due season for you. That, that God put the word here today, but it's a word for you whenever you're watching it. Amen. God put his word in here thousands of years ago. But guess what? It's a word for me today. Yes. It's a word that comes to me today. I dare to believe it. Because God operates in a timeless dimension. And that which is truth and that which is spoken is not just spoken for that moment in our time, but it is spoken for all eternity. The Bible says that Yahweh sends his word in the book of Psalms. Yahweh sends his word and it heals you. Yahweh sends his word in and it heals you. And, and a while ago meditating on that, I, I saw that that is a continual sending. The word says that, that Yahweh watches over his word to perform it. The word says that the word that goes out of his mouth will not return to him void, but will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. Amen. The word says that that word is working effectually inside you. That word, the word says that that word is medicine to your body. So the word of God has been put into you, not just through your ears and certainly not into your brain, but it's literally, literally, so you've got to believe these things. It's literally in your body and it is working effectually. The only one that can stop the word of God is not the devil, it's you yourself. You're the only one that has the power to stop what God is doing by the proclamation of his word. Well, I don't know about you, but see, that gets me excited to just come to the message today. You know, even if I didn't know what the message is, you know, I'm ready to hear a word. I'm ready to have the medicine of the word of God. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to hear. I'm ready to locate myself in the Word today. You're somewhere in this message today. Okay? I have a couple of pages of notes today. You're in there somewhere. I don't know where you are, but God knows where you are. There's things that, that God has planned that will come forth today. That you'll look later, they're not even written here at all. You say, well, where did that come from? came right from the throne room of God. You're in there. You're in there. I'm in there somewhere. I'm in there somewhere. I'm excited about the message today because God's going to speak to me. Hmm? I'm glad he's going to speak to you, but I'm excited he's going to speak to me. Hmm? I'm happy for you that God has a word for you, but I'm excited he has a word for me. Come on. I I'm, I'm expecting insight. It, it may come in the middle of talking and all of a sudden, boom, insight drops in me and I keep on going as if nothing had happened, but inside a shift took place, a change took place. I, I heard a word and said, I see that, boom, and I made an adjustment and I'm now headed in a little slightly different direction than I was before, but that little slight change is going to get propel me, you know, miles difference down the road because of what I heard today. Miles difference down the road because of what are you here today. See, you make these decisions before you come to the Word. Amen. You never sit listening to the Word with an attitude, prove it to me, Pastor. Convince me. I, I'm, I'm down and I want to be down. See if you can get me up. No, I can't. God Himself can't get you up. Glory to God. You make that decision beforehand. You make that decision. There's something here for me to hear. Amen. God's going to speak to me, me today. Yahweh. The creator of all that is, was, and ever will be is going to speak something to me that is so clear today 
that I will know that I know that I know that I've heard from my heavenly Father. I know it, I know it, I know that I've heard. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, we're, we're trying to get you set. We're trying to get you ready. And I'd say, wait, Holy Spirit in me. Because I'm wondering, why am I into all this? Because I need to get ready. You know, you can't, you can't go 15 minutes into the message and then finally connect. You know, get, 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 get ready at the beginning. Ready. You know, get your mind ready. Get your spirit ready to grab hold of it. Get your, get your hand ready to slap that mouth when it wants to say something different. Be, be sharp and alert. Get your sword ready that, that when a word comes forth and immediately there's a thought, well, I don't believe that. Kill that thought. Yes. Kill it. Take it captive. Get it out of there. Those are the thoughts that the devil brings immediately to steal the word from you. And you're having an intellectual debate. Not with me, but you're debating with God and you lose every time when you debate with God. You say, Pastor, how do you know I'm thinking that way? Because I think that way. Devil's, devil doesn't treat us differently. He deals with the mind. That's the only place he can. Amen? Glory to God. Are you ready? Do you want, do you want to go with this today? T turn over to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. This is going to help you today. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, this is going to set some things straight in your camp. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, uh, this uh, in, in Luke chapter uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, we're in the middle of a, a whole, uh, even actually back to, to uh, Luke uh, 10, 11, and 12. I mean, we're in the middle of a whole bunch of, of teachings of Yeshua about how the kingdom of God works, about how life works, about how you work. This is how you work. This is what's going on in your life. Uh, that's why he taught him. When we come to Luke chapter 15, I want you to turn to uh, verse 11, a very familiar parable. Uh, in some Bibles, I think they have headings there. The, the headings were not there by Luke. He didn't put them in there. The translators of the Bible did. You might have something that says the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, mine says the parable of the lost son. I've never seen a Bible yet that calls it what I think it should be called, the parable of the Father. Because <laughs> to me, it is a revelation of God. Now, there's, there's tremendous messages in it, and we're going to look at one today about locating yourself in the story, where are you in the story. But the overarching message of, of the story is it's a revelation of the absolute power of God's grace to redeem. My goodness gracious, I, don't want, I, I want to go down there, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stop saying I don't want to go down there because I do want to go down there. All right, verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Say a man. A man. Say two sons. two sons. Say two daughters. two daughters. Now I say say two daughters because I don't want you women to think you're studying about those bad men that do bad things and can't get their life together. <laughs> And you read, listen to the whole parable, sitting on the outside, wondering what the men are doing and those boys are doing, okay? So you need to think, and, and maybe he had two daughters. Come, you're in there, girls. Come on. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, say younger one. Okay, so we're, we know who we're talking about, okay? I, I look at this, I look at the long family, that be me. In the Long family, I have two siblings, a brother and sister, and they're older, okay? And I'm younger. And there, there's a certain arrogance in the younger that, that I recognize in me, a, a, a certain presumptuousness, presumptuousness uh, in youngers, okay? But if you're older, you have your own issues, as we're going to find out in a minute. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Give me my share of of the estate. Now, now let's stop and think what's going. He comes up and he's looking at his daddy's wealth. Notice again, this is a parable where this is not, what do, you, what do you mean? We're on welfare. I have no estate. You know, I tell people, they'll say to me, do I need a will? Well, it depends upon what you have. If you have nothing, you don't need a will. Now, if you have children, you need a will. That's a, that's a precious commodity. And in this state, for example, if if parents die and there's no will, the state's going to decide where those children go. Okay? And if you have several siblings and you want one sibling to receive them, 
and you don't want the other sibling to come anywhere near them, then you better have a will. Okay? Are, are, are you listening to me? You know, maybe the sibling that's very wealthy is not the one you want them to go to, and, and you have another sibling who, who financially is in more difficult straits, but because of their, their lifestyle, their beliefs and everything, you want that child to go there. You have a will for that. So he comes to his daddy and says, Father, uh, give me my share of the estate. Now that's absolute presumption. When do you get your share of the estate? What? When your father dies, that's right. You, 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 you get your estate when, when your father, are we clear on that? You get, when, when, when your father dies, you get the estate. I want to go down a little rabbit trail for a minute and I'm going to. <laughs> Jesus has already died. Why are you waiting to get to heaven to get your reward? You don't get your reward when you die. You get the estate when the estate owner dies. Christianity has put everything off into the future. When we all get to heaven, what a glorious day it'll be. I'm satisfied with a little cottage here because I have a mansion beyond the... See, we, we don't even have common sense when it comes to looking at the Bible. You get your estate when the father dies. When the owner of the state dies, he leaves it. And this is called the testament, New and Old Testaments. We could call it the will. This is the will of God. And in this will is everything he's left to you and me. Amen. 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 We on the same page? Okay. So, so he, he goes to his father and says, give me my share of the estate. Now, that's, that's pure presumption. And there's a lot of people uh, in the body of Christ who, who are operating with presumption. But it says he divided his property between them. So I assume the way it says he divided his property, that, that means his property. If he had lands and houses and, and investments and whatever, he divided it in half and said, all right, you know, half of the value is of this is, is there, goes to you, and half of the value goes to the other one, half the property. I want it now, and he divided it uh, with him. Glory to God. Another message in that. We're going somewhere else today, and there's hundreds of messages along the way. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. We don't know how long it was after that, but it was not long. Do you know the vast majority of people who win lotteries end up going broke? It's amazing. Somebody wins $10 million and, and five years later they're broke. Why? Because they got greedy suddenly. They never imagined having $1 million. So rather than find out how to manage the $10 million, they went wild. And then somebody came along and said, I can take the remaining five million you got left and I can turn it into 25 million. And they invested the five million and lost it all. You read any lottery, uh, state lottery site, it will warn you about that, that you need financial counseling or you will lose it no matter how much you have. That was a lot of money for this young man. Glory to God. It didn't take him long to count up the money and say, I can go live a wild lifestyle. It's interesting to read some of the wealthiest people uh, in our, our country. Uh, Bill Gates would be a good example of it. Uh, you know, he's richer than most countries in the world. He personally. It's absolutely amazing. But when you read their attitude toward giving the wealth to their children, now make no mistake, their children are well taken care of, but they don't get it all. They don't get it all. The vast majority of Bill's wealth, uh, Bill and Melinda, are putting into charitable work. We're not, we're not building, you know, $100 billion so our children can have a billion and just sit around it. No, you're going to have to earn more money if you want money. We'll make sure your needs are met, but it's not for you. Wise decision, because history of wealthy people talks about a lot of children who weren't told that, who were simply given money, and what did they do? They did exactly what this young man did. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, 
and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, say spent everything. He spent everything. My goodness, he spent everything. There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Remember, this is a Jewish boy. You can't get any lower than feeding pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17 is a remarkable sentence. And verse 17, again, not what we're preaching on it, we're going somewhere, but grab hold of it. Verse 17 is the key to most of your success. Verse 17 is the key that will get you out of all the failure in your life. When he came to his senses. Doesn't sound like a very spiritual transformation, does it? When he went to Pastor Long's sermon and got, got inspired by the the eloquent words that Pastor Long spoke. No. Not that you can't come to your senses in the middle of it, but it wasn't the eloquent words. Uh, he went to a mountaintop, and the mountain shook, and thunder roared, and lightning flashed, and Yahweh spoke. And then he did this. No. No. Mountains can shake. Come on. Thunder can roll, and Yahweh can speak. It doesn't mean you're going to change your mind. Glory to God. Yeshua could do no miracles in his own hometown. Yeshua, the Son of God. And it says he was amazed at that. He was startled by it. He, he was never amazed when faith worked. The only time he was amazed when their unbelief could stop the power of God. All I have to do is say the word and people are healed. I say the word, no one's healed. The power of their unbelief is stopping God Almighty. That, that's what amazed him. Glory to God. For many people, verse 17 is the reason why they're still stuck where they were 10 years ago. They won't come to their senses. They won't just put two and two together and say, wait a minute, what I've done all these years has brought me disaster. Why don't I do something different? Well, pastor, I'm, I'm just depressed. You've been depressed half your life. When are you going to get out of depression? You can spend the rest of your life trying to find people who pat you on the back and give you sympathy. Has it gotten you anywhere? Has their sympathy gotten you anywhere? You're still living in depression. And you're the one that's making that decision. Don't let anyone tell you that it's not your fault. Don't let anyone out tell you you can't change. You most certainly can. The Word of God says you can. You are making choices. Right. Right. It's when Yeshua came to the man by the pool and he said, do you want to get well? Who doesn't want to get well? There's lots of people who don't want to get well. They become used to living the way they, even though it produces bad things. They're an alcoholic, it's destroyed their life, but they continue to drink. They're smoking and have emphysema and their lungs are coming out and they still smoke. I saw a picture of a man smoking through a tube, breathing tube in his throat, and he's still smoking. My God, when are you going to realize that, that you'll come to your senses? But see, that's your decision. You're living exactly where you have chosen to live. You're living exactly where you have chosen to live. And you can make different choices. Amen. Little sermon along the way. We still haven't gotten to where I'm going. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Notice these four steps. Again, not the message for today, but catch it along the way. You want to get back on track? You want to get right with God? You want to walk in the blessings of God? Number one, come to your senses. Number two, decide to go back to where you got off the road. Decide to go back to where you got off the road. Number three, you have something to say. You better be saying it. And number four, finally, get up and do it. See, there are people who come to their senses and realize that it's wrong, but they refuse to go back to where they got off the road. They've rejected all that. Or they go back and get off the road, but they refuse to say what they need to say. Father, I've sinned against you. It's absolutely amazing how many people will not own up to sin. 
They'll say everything else. They'll give excuses. You know, it, 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 when we, when we, repentance, Teshuvah, we, we might teach about some of this uh, at Yom Kippur, but in Teshuvah, you've got to own it up. You did it. You sinned. David said when he cried out to God, I have sinned against you in heaven. This young man obviously had read Psalm 51 somewhere because he said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Yeah. Got to understand where it is. I remember my mother saying to me at one point in my teenage years, and I don't know what it, what it was, that was that I had done wrong, but I had done something wrong, and she looked at me with her little knitting needle, and, and she said, you go make it, make it right with you and God, and then it will be right with you and me. I love that. Where did she know that? How come it wasn't? You need to make it right with me. No, you make it right with God, and then it will be right with me. Well, that's Psalm 51. That's what this young man said. I sinned against heaven and against you. And by the way, my sin against you is, is terrible and may, may cause me pain, but sin against heaven can cause you death. Sin against heaven can be eternal. You know, we seem to be, not care what God thinks about what we're doing, but we care about what our neighbor says. Hmm? We ought to be more concerned with God. Glory to God. Another message, we're not going there. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods, so he came to his senses. He decided to go back, get, get uh, on the road where he belonged. He had something to say. And the last thing in verse 20 is, so he got up and went to his father. A lot of people try the process of getting back and it comes to verse 20 and in counseling, I find out they don't do it. Simple little instructions. I've told the story many times of the young man, he and his wife are separated and I told him, listen, you know, uh, you need to go take your wife out for a meal. It can be McDonald's, it can be anywhere. You know, just take her out for a meal. And when you've done that, call me and we'll set up your next counseling appointment. And three weeks later, he called and said, Pastor, uh, you know, we, we, we haven't been getting together. Uh, can I set up an appointment? And I said to him, I'd love to set up an appointment with you. Have you taken your wife out to eat? He said, well, not yet. And I said, great. When you do, I, I'd be glad to meet with you. Next thing I know, he's yelling and screaming on the phone. What kind of a pastor are you? You don't care. You're saying you won't meet with me. I will not meet with you if you will not do what you're told. End of story. Is that clear? You know, the audacity that you're going to come and take up my time, by the way, and you don't pay me the $150 an hour you pay the psychiatrist, and, and then you're not going to do. Come on. I, re I remember Ashley's doctor one time, very, very nice gentleman and, and very competent in his field and everything, but he was wanting to do certain things that Ashley was unwilling to do. And, and I just re this little quiet man, you know, and, he's, and he says, what is the point of me being your doctor if you won't do what I tell you? You know, and he was, he, that frustration finally hit him because he was always like, I recommend this, Ashley's going to do this. I know your family's into different things and all, but finally, whatever this issue was, uh, you know, he just said, what is the point of me being your doctor if you won't do, and it's like his total professionalism dissolved. <laughs> you know, he had that moment of, yeah, you know, what is the point of me being your doctor if you're not going to do what I tell you? And he got under control. Okay, I understand. And blah, 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 blah. And he became the professional doctor again. I wanted to grab and say, I can relate to that. <laughs> I can relate to that. You know, 50 years of, of counseling with people, the vast majority of whom who won't do basic things I tell them to do. Basic things. You know, I... I you know, it's like I got to the point where I, I quit asking people because it became discouraging. You know, everybody tithes. Yeah, everybody tithes. Let, let me see your budget. You know, Cruffalo Dollar tells his old staff they have to give him uh, their IRS forms. His staff, he's got 400 and something people on his staff. Because, uh, you know, he learned what I've learned. People lie. People lie. I tithe. And I, I'm, Pastor, I don't understand why I'm not prospering. I'm a tither. You're lying. You're not. And so I'm trying to get in agreement. We're not in agreement. And so he insists on that because he says, how can you lead other people in tithing if you're not tithing? Yeah. Glory to God. It's quiet in this church house. Come on. It's, it's, it's verse 20. I'm just telling you it's verse 20. Maybe that's what I ought to just say. People come up. Pastor, I don't know why things aren't working. Luke 15, 20. I have little prescription cards. I, I ought to write on my prescription card. Luke 15, 20. Standard. Luke 15, 20. 
Now, it could be Luke 15, 17. You haven't come to your senses. But once you come to your senses, just go out, Luke 15, 20, get up and do it. Get up and do it. People insist they're doing what they are. People insist they're speaking right. But even as they talk to me, I hear that they're speaking negative. I don't speak negative. You do it all the time. You do it all the time. Come on, just, just do it. <laughs> I want to go down that one, but I'm not going to. Because we're going somewhere. Are you still with me on this little journey here? Come on. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with, what's the word? Compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf, kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Glory to God. Great story. I, I love to preach on, I love preaching on the, on the parable of the father here. I mean, what a, what a great story. He's not holding things against you. The problem that we have in the church is this. We want to get the best robe and the new ring, but we don't want to say, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. We don't want to confront the depth of our sin. We don't want to confront the arrogance of our life where we have said, no. well, you forgive me, Abba. And, and, and we now want to pick up and walk on. Totally unwilling to accept the the. the the massive hurt that has been injected into your relationship with Abba. We don't even do it with one other. With one another. We want to have quick forgiveness. We do something that hurts somebody deeply and at the core of their being and alters their confidence in us or maybe their confidence in God. We say, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. We want to pick and move, move on. You do need to be able to pick up and move on, but you, you got to uh, uh, allow space for the recognition of the depth of what you've done. And see, in this super grace preaching, we don't want to admit any guilt, anything that's, you know, you were a sinner, lost, condemned to hell, but in Christ you get saved, but we don't want to ever admit that our life of sin condemned us to hell. I was going to hell, good. I was brought up in church. I always thought of myself as a Christian. I believed Christian doctrines, whatever belief meant. I went to church every week. I did all that stuff. And at the age of 16, I discovered I had never given my life to Christ. I had never surrendered the leadership of my life. I had never once asked him, what do you want me to do with my life? I had never accepted that, in fact, he is God. And that he has a right to tell me what to do and where to go and how to live my life. I had never once made that decision. I, you know, I was doing all kinds of good things, but I had never surrendered my life to him. And I remember sitting in that church that day when it dawned on me, I'm going to hell good. Now, I began to realize my good wasn't very good when you compare good. But I mean, I, at that point in my life, you know, I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't getting drunk. I didn't swear. I, I, I didn't, you know, watch things I shouldn't watch. Well, at least those kinds of bad things I didn't watch. And, and, you know, so I looked around the world and I found people who were immoral and people who were gross. And, and I said, well, I'm better than them, so I'm good. But I found out I was going to hell good because I was good, but I wasn't born again. Come on, I was doing the best of what my human nature could do, but I wasn't born again. I didn't have a spirit man that had been regenerated in me. Glory to God. We want to get to the grace without going to the recognition of who we are. And we need to recognize that. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Another message. What, what am I on? Six? I got six messages that I could do here. You know, we're halfway through my sermon and I haven't gotten to where I'm going because of all these little messages that I'm just making you aware of. Well, Holy Spirit's making you aware because that's your homework is to go back and read uh, Luke chapter 15 and now say, oh yeah, let's dig in this a little deeper than Pastor was able to go. The father uh, celebrates his return and, and they begin to celebrate. Verse 25, ha, we have finally gotten to where I'm going. <laughs> Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son, say older son, was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. 
Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Imagine the father's pleading with him. The father has a right to command. The father has a right to demand. The father has a right to say, enough is enough, zap, you're out of here. But your life and my life is evidence of the father continually pleading with us when we're wrong. Trying to woo us back, trying to bring us back in. He doesn't come into the life of his children with judgment and say, that's it, you're out. Praise God he doesn't, I'd be out. He's pleading with him. Get the image. The father's pleading with him. But, verse 29, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not my brother, but when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? Wow. And in contained in those few little verses there, those few little words, we understand a worldview that this young man had that absolutely destroyed his life. He's in the father's house. The reason I love this is it's not a salvation story. We got to get over when we talk about walking in the kingdom of God, it's not about being saved. If you're not saved, you can't even be in the kingdom of God. And whenever I talk about commands and rules and lifestyles and what the Bible's trying to teach you and me how to live, you know, grace people get up to, well, you're putting people under law. No, it's not about salvation. It's once you're saved, what do you do? Come on, keeping the law will never make you a citizen of America. But once you become a citizen, you are obligated to keep the law. And if you don't keep the law, even though you're a citizen, you may spend all the years of your citizenship in jail. Think about that. You've come to the land of opportunity, the land of absolute freedom, and you come here and you pass all the tests and you get in, and you're now a legal citizen, but you break a serious law, you commit a serious crime, and now as a citizen, you spend the rest of your life in prison in a land of freedom. Come on, that'll preach. People get out of the bondage of sin, come over into the kingdom of God, and it's a land we're going to find out in many of great opportunity, but if you break the laws of the kingdom, you're in bondage to the prison of the devil all the days of your life as a Christian. And you live and die broken, you live and die sick, and you live and die discouraged because you're in prison even though you're in the land of opportunity. Do you see it? What a shame. Better to have, in, in, not better in the long term, but, but it would seem that there'd be times when it would have been better if you didn't believe and stayed a sinner but you were healthy than to get into the kingdom of God and now you accept disease on your body or poverty in your life because somebody tells you teaching prison, imprisoning people by the words that you preach. Terrible. We get them into the country, but we haven't told them there's laws for living freely in the country. You want the blessings of America? There's, there's legal ways to do it. Illegal ways will put you behind bars. Mm. Let's keep moving here. <laughs> so the other side of the story is the elder brother. And in verses 25 all the way through 32, uh, we, we find a different worldview. Verse 29 is a worldview that will destroy all the blessings of the covenant. These attitudes in the life of a believer negate all the promises you can find in the Bible. You can have a, a promise book and, and, and look at every promise in here, but you develop these attitudes and it will destroy your life and those around you. The first one is this. He says to his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. There are Christians 
who count it a burden to be a Christian. What? It means, a, well, you know, you can't this and you can't do this. And so they're living their life and they're obeying the laws of God, but reluctantly. I'd like to go get drunk, but I can't. I'd like to go get high, but I can't. I'd like to have an affair, but I can't. I'd like to have fun, but I can't. And they're developing an attitude of resentment about God. They're keeping his laws because, well, he's God, you know, and he might zap you, and he might do bad things to you. And so they're in the field working. <clears throat> They're in the field working. They're on the mission field. They're in the pastorates. They're, they're, they're working for God, but their attitude is one of resentment. I have a, a common approach I had when young men would come to me back when I was in the denominational world and, and had a position uh, dealing with young men who wanted to be in the ministry. And they'd come and, and say, you know, I, I, I want to I, I be a pastor. And my first thing to them was, well, let me, let me ask you this. Could you do something else with your life and feel satisfied that you're serving God? And if they said, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I could be a teacher and serve God, or I, I could be a this, I said, then you're not called. You're going to get in trouble doing, being a pastor because it's a good thing to do because people tell you. If you don't know that you know that you know that you know that the, a call in your life, the church world will eat you up and spit you out. Hmm? It, it'll do that. I, wanna, I want you to know, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. You, you got to know, why don't you quit? Because at the end of the day, I can't. Because there's something in my life that's got hold of me, and woe to me if I don't live this out. Come on. Glory to God. And, and, and so this young man is, is serving God. He's in the field. What a phrase, because that's a phrase we use about people who are full-time. Yeah, they're evangelists. They're, what, they're in the field, but he's got an attitude that he is slaving away for God. Now, he may be slaving away for religion. Come on. Christianity as a religion has terrible, terrible visions of what pastors should be and do, leaders should be and do. You know, God comes first, the church comes second, and your family comes third. That's a bunch of hogwash. That's not in the Bible at all. Not in the Bible at all. And why is the landscape filled with so many children of pastors who go astray and go do their old things? Because that's what they lived with. Dad doesn't have time for me. Dad can't spend any time with me. Dad doesn't care with me, care for me because, you know, the church has first claim. And that, that image is carried on. And what happens is, as life moves on, there are a lot of older, resentful pastors. They can't wait to retire. And, and while they'll point at the church and what the church has done, inside, if they can admit it, they can come to their senses and make things right. Inside, they're mad at God. What was once exciting to them, I, I'm called into the ministry, now they're mad at God. And how can you be mad at God? I had a pastor's wife come to me one, one time years and years ago uh, talking about her resentment of her husband's lifestyle. And she said this. She said, he's got a mistress in his life. And how can I, can, how can I complain about it? It's God. You know, whenever the phone rings and it's the mistress, somebody in the church needs, somebody here needs, somebody here needs. And whenever the phone rings, the church, this other woman in his life, calls and off he goes. And she says, and how can I complain? It's God. Then I thought of a man who came one time. And he said that the, the struggle in his life, he says, my wife is having an affair. And I said, what do you mean your wife's having an affair? There's a guy in her life, and she talks about him all the time. And, 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 and she's in conversations with him constantly. And, and, and I, I have no part of it at all. And, and it's taken everything in her, in her life. I mean, she's in love with this guy. I said, well, who is he? It's Jesus. His wife got born again. And she's truly in love with the Lord. And I, my answer to him, well, how is she treating you? He said, well, she's treating me better than she ever had. You know, she doesn't argue with me. She's not there. I said, so let me see. She, she's having a love affair with a man 
But the effect of that love of that man is she's turning into a woman who is everything you need. Sounds to me like you need to meet the man that she knows. Mm -hmm. And he finally did one day. He came into to the pastor I was working with, Chris Lyons. He came into Chris said, I give up. I give up. I surrender. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> she loved him into the kingdom of God. <laughs> he said, I can't take it anymore. I, I've got to know this man. Okay? Are, are, are you still with me? Listen. But see, there, there's people who, who have resentment. Come on. Resentment. I, I've, I've dealt with Christian marriages where the challenge is that the marriage is broken. I mean totally broken. Totally broken. But they believe that divorce is totally unacceptable, so they're staying together. Do you know what happens when you're staying together but you hate it? It's a terrible environment for everybody concerned. But beyond that, they end up hating God because they blame God for making them stay together. My life is miserable. You know, it's, it's in a mess. And God, you, may, you made me stay together. And so underneath all their Christianese and coming to church and singing their songs, underneath there is an abject hostility toward God. If they were to be honest underneath all the praise and everything is, God, I am mad at you. Do you know what you do when you're mad at God? You tell him. It's not a surprise to him. He knows. You're going to have an honest relationship with God or pretend? He knows anyway. Come on. I, I remember, I rem I'm just checking this story because I don't like to go down personal stories at all the time. There's... I remember a time we were having a clergy event dealing with death and dying. We had pastors, we had priests, we even had some nuns there. And the man that was leading, there was probably about maybe a dozen, two dozen of us. It was several days of a thing. And he was leading us to deal and confront our, our feelings and reality about death. Because most people, even Christians, like to pretend it's not there. It is there. Well, it didn't impact me. Impacting you and destroying you are two different things. Right. Grief is a spirit. If you get into grief, it will destroy your life. But Yeshua wept when he came to the tomb of, uh, of, uh, of Lazarus. Okay, so don't get in a ditch where you just give in to grief. That's a spirit that will control you. But you get to a point, I have no feelings. Of course you have feelings. And so we had been through some, some pretty dramatic things. Uh, I... We did some role playing. I, I got to share this with you because I want to create some pictures to help you understand how people think. And one of the role playing we were doing, there was a, a mother. The person was to play the role of a mother, this woman. I'm going to be the mother in this case. And she's the mother of a 16-year-old girl. And there's, a, I think there was a son and a husband. Okay, that's the family. And they're going to have a dialogue. But the way we're, we're trying to break free dialogues is this. Behind each one of them, they're sitting in a circle is called their unspoken self. So behind the father, whatever he's saying, would be another man standing behind him speaking uh, what he thinks the father is thinking but isn't saying. And so Lenny Gibbs, who was leading it, said, Don, go stand behind the, the mother. I don't know why he picked me, I guess. but <laughs> So I'm standing behind this woman, and, and the dialogue begins. And the scenario is this. The mother just found out she's dying of cancer and only has a few months to live. And so the mother's trying to, you know, deal with the family, and the family's trying to deal with the mother, and they're having this. And she's saying these very Christianese words to her daughter. And I'm the altar behind it. I don't know how to do this. So I get out of my head, and I drop into my heart, and I say, Holy Spirit. It's like Holy Spirit just said, I'm going to get you where feelings are so you know what's going on. And, and I'm standing behind her, and she said, you, you know, God has everything under control. And out of my mouth, I heard me say, but I'm extremely sad I'm going to miss your prom. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? You ever read when Yeshua is asked questions and he gives answers that seem to have nothing to do with what's going on? And those words, I'm really going to miss your prom. When I said it, this woman absolutely broke down in sobs. 
I mean, I'm going to miss your prom. I mean, she dissolved right in front of me. I didn't know. Her mom died and missed her prom when she was a teenager. How could I ever know that? And that experience was unresolved. Where can you go into the church and say, I'm sad because my mom missed my prom? That's not very spiritual, but it's very real. It's very real. How, how, do, we, how do we plug into uh, the, the things that are real? And, and so in that, the reason I'm telling this story is to give you the dynamics. In that, we were talking about death a lot, and I found things were stirring in me, and I didn't like it. I'm trying to keep this at an intellectual level. Yeah, I understand what the Bible says, and I do all this and everything. And at one point, we're in a, in a little chapel room, and there's an altar up there. And Lenny Gibbs t- turns to me and says, Don, you have a lot of feelings about that. And I said, I do. He says, come here, I want you to do something for me. And he takes me up, and he has me. He says, come and I want you to stand right up here in front of the altar. And I want you to address God and tell him how you feel. I looked at Lenny. And I said, I'm not going to do that. He says, it'll be helpful. I said, it will be extremely helpful, but I'm not going to do it. And he said, okay. Now I'll tell you two ends to that story. When the break came up, I said, Lenny, let me tell you why I said I wouldn't. I was adamant, I'm not going to. Because the two nuns sitting in that room were having a a terrible challenge accepting that pastors and priests might might have feelings about death. And I said, I I just know that if I do that, I'm going to get pure rejection and judgment coming out of them. And it's vulnerable enough to be honest, but I'm not going to be honest with someone who's going to say, well, how can you feel that way? Never going to talk to you in my life. And I said, I don't need to... Well, at the end of the the three-day thing, those nuns said, in reviewing the whole thing, we were just shocked at, at, at feelings that clergy have. Wait, 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 do we lose our right to have feelings? So I didn't do it there. I just went home and did it. <laughs> I said, God, you and I need a, need a talk. I, I don't need my theology straightened. My theology is right. And I went back to uh, the second church that I was pastor of, Christ Church United in Dracut, Massachusetts. And there was an elderly gentleman in that church who had died that year of emphysema. His name was Jimmy. And Jimmy was a faithful Christian. None of us knew anything about healing, by the way. We just didn't know. And, and Jimmy had, was in and out of the hospital, and it was Christmas. And uh, so I'm going to visit Jimmy, and, you know, he's having terrible time breathing. And, and I... I'm talking with him. I said, Jimmy, uh, it's, it's Christmas Eve. I, I need to go to the service. I said, how would you like me to pray? And Jimmy looked at me right in the eye and he said, Pastor, would you pray that Jesus take me home tonight? Well, Pastor, you know, that's your time to, he really needs to be pumped up and he really needs to give him script. No, no, no. I can give them all those scriptures and pray those kind of prayers, and we're not in agreement. We're not in agreement. The Bible says prayers are answered when they're in agreement. I can pray that he be healed, but he doesn't want to be healed. He wants to go home. He's 79, 82. I don't know how old Jimmy was. Is it too early? Absolutely. But that's not what he wants. And as a young pastor, inexperienced, who didn't know anything other than listen to your heart and have compassion, I reached out and grabbed his hand and I said, Father, Jimmy wants to be home with you tonight. So if in any way it's in your plan or will or permissiveness, would you take him? And I said, Amen. And he looked at me with the sweetest smile and said, Amen. And in that moment, I was just, now I look back and I know exactly what was going on. But in that moment, I looked at him and I said, say hello to Jesus for me tonight. During our Christmas Eve service, he went home to be with the Lord. Those are 
some of the feelings that you engage in and, and, and you decide I'm either going to be out of my head and I'm going to give you the word and what the word says or I'm going to minister to where people are. As a result of all that, Mildred, his, his, his uh, wife, she became very close to me. She, uh, she likewise was an older woman. She was my champion in the church. Boy, when I would do radical things, she'd get in there and she'd say, let the young pastor do something. You know, I mean, she was like, I get a phone call one day. And the voice in the other end says, Mildred was just killed in a car accident. I said, Mildred doesn't drive. And they said, she wasn't. She was crossing the street. And I went up into my bedroom and I lay on that bed and I cried and cried. And I cried out to God saying, why? Why? Now I know why. <laughs> Come on. I know what the Bible teaches. I know that wasn't God that did it. I know there's a real devil. I, I know all the answers. My, my theology wasn't impacted that day. I didn't come out and say, well, if God can't do that, what kind of a God is he? I didn't even put a dent in my theology because my theology is based on the word of God and the word has answers. But what happened that day is that down long the son of God had an open hearted conversation with him and said, God, it must, it's painful to be in this. And in the midst of that honesty, I heard God say it's painful for him too. He's not some robot in the sky. He's not some computer in the sky. Wow, my word says and this. Uh, Jesus wept, was trying to show us something, that God is a God of compassion. And when things are put in motion that God has no legal right to change, he doesn't sit there saying, well, you made your bed lie in it. He hurts. And when David and Bathsheba's first son died because of what had been cast into that relationship, a devil, the devil had a legal right to come and take that child's life. And David had that good theology. I interceded and wept while there was hope, but now he's gone. I freshen up, pick up my life, and move on because he's gone into eternity. I'll see him there. But in the midst of that, there was pain, but what I never saw was God was in heaven weeping that day. He is a God of compassion. And when you mess up your life and when I mess up my life, God is not some judge in heaven putting another check mark on, on your bad list. He's in heaven weeping because he knows what you're putting in place and what might happen and, and doors you've opened up that should never have been opened up and he knows that and he weeps. And then he does what he, where he keeps coming in to try to plead with you to get you back because you can always get back until it's over. I think there's many people in the family of God that end up in heaven way too soon. And I think when they get to heaven, our Heavenly Father welcomes them with great joy and puts His arms around them and it's so good to have you home. But I believe there's moments when you look in God's eye at that moment and He looks in your eye and you both know it was too soon. God knows that. And you know that. Father, I'm so sorry that I didn't listen and I left too early. Son, I'm so sorry you did too because I had lives to change through you, but that's past now. Let's move forward. The elder brother is serving God with a resentful attitude. Look, I've slaved for you. The minute you think your Christian faith is slavery and bondage and you have to, you don't have a clue what the family of God is about. You haven't even begun to understand it yet. You don't know the good things you have. We're going to look at that in closing in a minute. 
You're so wrapped up in what you can't do, what you have to give up, what you don't have. You're so self-centered, you're not even enjoying your own life, and you're in the family of God. I've slaved for you all my life. You develop that attitude in your life, it's going to be one of ungratefulness. But more than that, the sadness, and the sadness for Yahweh is, you don't know what you have. Glory to God. Give me a minute, I've got to find my notes, I don't even have a clue where I am. Here we go. All these years I've been slaving for you. Secondly, you never once gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. With, with an attitude, I've been a slave. I have an attitude that I'm keeping count of what you give me. Again, self-centeredness. Well, God didn't give me that. or God didn't give me that. Well, I was believing for that, and you didn't give me that. We, we think about what he didn't give us rather than what he did give you. There's a point this week when looking at the sermon when I just walked around my life. I mean that, I walked around my life from, from a 16-year-old teenager who gave my life to the Lord and, and, and how, how God has blessed us. Donna and I are extremely blessed people. Extremely blessed people. Hmm? Does that mean I'm sitting there with a bank account with hundreds of thousands of dollars in it? No, it doesn't. Well, actually, I do have that, but it's not here. I have a, a pretty large bank account in, in the heavenly bank account and I'm learning how to pull it into this account as I need it. I'm extremely blessed. Come on. You know, with, with some of the experiences I've, I, I've had in life, you know, I, wh what could I say? Could, could I, you never gave me, I didn't have? Could I go watch other preachers with larger churches and get jealous and say, I can preach as good as them? Because the answer is, I can, in many cases, better. Come on. You know, could I say, God, I, I, what, what gives? Here we are on Bowtell Street. You've given us a building that can seat 250. Where are they? By the way, I have no problem believing that the day would come when this is entirely filled. Glory to God. But why would I give, you never gave me? What did you give me? What, what a way to spend your life, looking at what God didn't. You never gave me a, a kid. You never gave me this. You never gave me. You never gave me. You never gave me. People are so quick, even in the body of Christ, so quick to be mindful of what God hasn't done. That's a dead end for you. You're going to live a miserable life. And your misery is your own. It's the choices you're making. You're choosing to look at life that way. You're choosing to look at what God hasn't done. Don't come to me and tell me to fix it for you. I can't fix it for you. It's what are you meditating on? What are you thinking? You've got negative thinking in you, and the best thing can happen to you, you'll destroy it. And by the way, that starts at a very young age. Little children learn to be negative about life. Little children can learn that, 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 you know, what's mine is mine, and if you've got something that's, that's different, I want that too, and they're never happy. They're not sharers. They're takers. What, what a terrible way to go through life, because then you get in life, you start becoming demanding, and then demanding people alienate people around them. Come on. Whole message there, I'm not going there, because I want to get this brought to a conclusion here. You never even gave me a goat. God has never given me. God has not taken care of me. Well, if that's true, why are you hanging around? Go find another God. The God I know has taken care of me. Well, I tell you, I can't wait till we get to, well, I can wait. I will wait until Sunday night because we're going to have a great time when we find out what remembering is all about. It'll change your life if you'll get hold of it. It's the choices you make. I make choices every day you do too. Do I remember this or do I remember that? 
Why do some people see the glass half full and other people see it half empty? Why, why do people look at the same situations in life and some see the, the, the sunshine and some see the rain clouds? You know? And if your life was programmed negatively, that's where you're going to spend your life unless you make a change. What you believe is your worldview, and it will determine how much you get out of life. His belief was, God never gives me anything. And what is the truth? Verse 31. Verse 31 is the truth. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have, is yours. You're always with me. And the truth is, everything I have is yours. You never gave me a, so much as even a little goat. Stupid son. You're living with me. Everything I have is yours. You want a fatted calf and have a party? Go get the fatted calf, kill it, and have a party. It's as much yours as it is mine. I'm not here to serve you. I'm not here to wait on you because I expect you to know. Whatever's mine is yours. All your life you've been slaving away, blaming the Father because he didn't give me, slaving away, I have to work in the field, I have to do this, unaware that everything the Father has is already yours. I have a crazy attitude about friendship. My attitude is if you're true, true friends, then what I have is yours and what, what you have is mine, if we're true friends. I tell people, you come to my house, you'll be treated as a guest once. You don't know where things are, I'll get things for you, I'll do that. But if you're going to be repeatedly in my house, you know where the glasses are, you know where the cold water is. You can open the refrigerator and look in and say, there's some grapes in there, can I have some? Or just take them. It'd be better if you ask, but... Come on. You know, it's like, what I have is, is yours. What you have is mine. That's what Yahweh's trying to get through to us. Everything he has is ours. The whole world is ours. The trees, the sunset, the, the beautiful sky, that's all ours, belongs to us. Thank you for giving that to me. Now, you can do with it what you want. You can burn the trees. You can, you can demolish the environment. You can destroy rather than build up. Or you can do what the Jews are trying to teach us all to do, which is tikkun olam. You can fix your world. Even Christians in Haiti have a poverty mentality. And they have no awareness of bringing their world up. And so when we first started going down there, I noticed Christian school teachers, even the pastors, you know, you give them a candy bar, they eat the candy bar, and they throw the wrapper on the ground. You know, we got there one day, and we're going to clean up the schoolyard. The children are laughing. They've never seen anything like it. You know, they didn't have a rake, so we had to figure out what we're going to do. But it's like, no, everything. To, but, but even the pastors, they're not thinking I'm being sloppy. They have a Haitian attitude. It's a cultural attitude that is destructive to the things of God when you're trying to bring them up. So we had to teach them. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little plot here and plant some grass and have grass? You, you don't need to have the rich people's big things, but can you improve what you have? Can you put That's fresh right. paint on what you have? That's right. That's right. Can you take what you have and make it the best of what you have? Uh -huh. But there's an attitude in life that, it, that is, I take, 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 take means I destroy. I take the energy out and put nothing back. I use the house, and when it's abused and falling apart, then I sell it or get rid of it or default on it. Everything that God has is ours. And you and I are living in a world that is evidence of what men do with that world. By and large, they destroy it. But we're not talking about that world out there. We're talking about your world. God gives you a world as a child of God and you get to make out of it what you want to make out of it. You get to have everything that God said you can have. 
You can take your new life in Christ and say, I have the mind of Christ, therefore I'm not dumb, I'm not stupid, I'm not, I, can, I can learn anything I need to, and you no longer ever speak about yourself in a negative way intellectually because you fully are capable of doing all things. A Ben Carson can come out of the ghettos of Detroit. Had his mother not done what she did to make him do that, he would have been like any other child growing up in that neighborhood. Ben Carson would be a name nobody knows, and he'd probably be in prison. He's a well-known surgeon because in the midst of that, his mother taught him how to make the best of it and that he could do what God gave him a brain to do. But if you keep speaking the negative, you are forming your own environment. I've been slaving all this time. You've never given me anything. Give you anything. Everything I have is yours. The truth is that all that God has is already yours. You have everything you need for life and godliness is what Peter says. You already have. Well, I have it. Where is it? Well, with that kind of an attitude, I can tell you why you don't have it. It's there. He didn't give it to me. I deserve it. You know, you, you got a grouchy, complaining attitude. Don't think you're going to get anything from God. The book of James says you ask for things from God and you don't get them because you ask amiss. Read it. What's amiss? I'm asking for me. I want a new car so I look good. I want a new car so I've got status. I want a new car so people will think how good I'm doing. How about you, you want a new car because it's a good thing to have? Doesn't mean anything about you. Whether I'm not a better person because I have a new car. I'm not a worse person because I don't. But if I have a complaining attitude, then guess what? I don't even appreciate what I have. Three days later, the, the junky car you have falls apart. Now you have to walk. Now you appreciate your junky, junky car. Come on. An attitude of gratitude. Attitude uh, determines your altitude. Keith Moore said this, this week, and I want to wrap up with these thoughts. Every, for every situation, there is a word. Every situation in your life, there is a word. And if spoken the word will become flesh. There's a word from God, and you get hold of that word, and if you'll start speaking that word, that word will now take on flesh. If you won't speak it, then what you're doing is you're meditating on other things. It is the spoken word. Speaking lack produces having lack. Speaking, my God meets all my needs, then all your needs are met. Speaking, I can't, and therefore you literally can't. When you say, I can't, I know you can't. Well, but pastor, you say you can do all things. You can all do all things according to your belief, but you keep saying, I can't, so I'm just agreeing with what you're saying. Of course you can't. Of course you can't, because you keep saying you can't. Or speaking, I can do all things through Yeshua, and suddenly you begin to do. Speaking sickness, reporting on all your physical illnesses and issues, you're going to have more and more sickness in your life. Or you can speak, I am the healed of the Lord, and see health and wholeness grow in your life. What do you want to speak? Speaking, dad, mom, pastor, the boss, care more about others than about me, you're going to feel left out. You're, you're, it's, it's not a real world, you're creating it. It's not that mom loves others more than you, that dad loves others, your boss favors others than you, but you keep speaking it and you keep getting it. And you're creating your own world and around you God will put people to plead with you to change your way of speaking, to change your way of thinking. And they're trying to get you to wake up that you're destroying your own life right in the midst of it, but you don't want to hear it. You don't want to change. Glory to God. Speaking that I am appreciated by my boss. I'm loved by my parents. I am a person of favor. Starting to speak that, you'll begin to see it. Dealing with life with chips on your shoulders guarantees you lose. What's a chip on your shoulders? Wow, you can't tell me that. And I'm this and I'm that. Have at it. Go for it. Go for it. Live your life. By the way, how are you enjoying it? I've been around life long enough to know those with chips on their shoulders, you know, you're going to be 50, 60, 70, you're going to be an old person with chips on your shoulder 
sitting in a nursing home, complaining and bitter about life because you've had chips on your shoulders. Nobody could tell you anything. I'm, I'm, I'm just a flagman. I'm trying to tell you what's down the road. Come on, get the, get the chips off your shoulders and start fitting in, belonging and appreciating what you have, not getting upset with what you don't have. Everybody isn't going to like you. Come on, there's people out there who do not like me. I think I'm a, I can be a likable person. But there's, there's people out there who don't like me. I say, you don't know me. If you really knew me, you'd like me. They don't like me. There's people out there who think I'm arrogant. There's people out there who think I'm a leader of some kind of cult thing. There's people out there who, if you speak a confident word, you know, they think, well, who do you think you are? I'm speaking a confident word from God. And they don't like it. They hate it. They end up hating it. Well, that's their problem. See, I've got a problem if I let that irritate me. Yeah. No, they've got the problem. Why would I take it onto there? They come up to give me a piece of their mind. I say, I don't want a piece of your mind. <laughs> I have real estate up here. There's real estate here. And, and it says, I don't give you any real estate. You know, I, I don't think about it. I don't work. You know, I, anything that will get me acting pretty quickly is when I find that I have allowed you to have real estate negatively in my brain. I am, you know, you're off doing your own thing. You forgot the dump that you put on me and everything. There I am, the one they said this and they did this. So uh, You're not even thinking about it anymore. You got real estate in my mind. Actually, the devil does, and I kick him out. And I'm going to give you real estate in my mind. Is, is this making some sense to you? So the elder son has everything that the father has and is enjoying nothing. Dan and Janet Warner uh, started Marriage Encounter with me for the United Church of Christ years ago, and, and the Warners and the Andersons uh, became just dear, dear friends. We were, we were just like a covenant team that went around changing our world as we knew it in those days. And, and I was in the Warners' house at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week, uh, involved in, in the, with their two children. Dan was the managing editor of the Lawrence Eagle Tribune. And so we had a lot of marriage encounter leadership meetings in, in his house. And I remember one day showing up, and he had told me, you know, uh, meeting's supposed to start at 2. He says, uh, Janet and I uh, have something to do. We'll be there at 2.30. Just go ahead. Make yourself at home. So I get there, and there's some other couples there ready for this meeting. They're all in the driveway. And so I just go, and, and they say, well, Dan and Janet are here. I said, they'll be here later. And I opened the door and went in. <laughs> and so they kind of come in behind me. And then we're, they all sit in the living room, and I go over into the kitchen, and I open the refrigerator and stick my head in. Janet always had fruit in there. And, I, and yep, there's a bowl of fruit. I grab the bowl. She, what are you doing? I said, I'm eating some fruit. <laughs> you always just walk into people's houses and look in the refrigerator? No, but I do in family. Well, what if she had it saved for something? She should have put a note. <laughs> <laughs> Don, if you're around the house, don't eat this. This is for <laughs> If it's in the house, Jordan will tell you. She knows that. I mean, if there's something that, that she wants to make sure she and Donna get to eat, she hides it. I mean, I do. Desserts suddenly get hidden. You know, we have dessert on Shabbat, and it's wonderful. To, and, you know, so the next day I'm thinking, oh, I'd like another piece of that, and I go looking for it. I can't find it. She doesn't know this until right now as I'm telling her this. I actually sometimes search. Now, come on, she, maybe she froze it. So I'm looking in all the freezers. I'm looking, I, you know, it's like, I mean, I, I think I found some stuff. So she, she knows the game's going on. So she's getting more. One day I said, did she put it in the bedroom? I mean, I don't know. I know there, I know there was a piece of cake, you know. And, and what Jordan will say, Dad, you know, you, you ate that last piece of cake, and that was for Mom. She, it's never for her. She never gets upset about her. But it's Mom. She always, I said, Mom isn't going to eat it. It's been in there five days. It's getting hard. Mom, get, get it through your head. Mom is not going to eat it. Remind mom that you're okay, but remind her, and there's a prowling dad who will eat it if you don't. <laughs> and you're blessed that it's arrived five days. Well, you know, by five days, even she won't eat it because it's hard. But me, it's cake. I'll eat it. It's, it's, and it's a healthy cake, by the way. It's healthy. No sugar in it or anything like that. You know, don't, don't bring those things. You know, come on, come on. You know, what, what, is, what is yours is mine. 
So Don, I, I got it. I, I, you still with me? Because this this is making a point. I, it really is. You know, we have food bars in the house that periodically we're running out or doing something. We'll have a healthy food bar, not junk food bars. And uh, Donna ordered, or one of them ordered these new food bars. And they're sitting uh, in there. There's a box of them, and I'd never seen them before. And you know, we've gotten food, we've gotten healthy green food bars that are like eating alfalfa. Yeah. You know, it's a, one bite, and it's like, that's a little, where are you? You know, I mean, it's like, I don't mind eating healthy, but I don't want to start mooing after I've, I've eaten. You know, and then we have some ones that have nuts and salty flavors to them that are kind of nice. But this was a new one. And it said something about chocolate on it and everything. And I thought, well, that's good. So I opened it up and I took my first bite. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. I took the second bite. Oh my. <laughs> and I ate the whole bar. Which is okay. It, this won't make sense to many of you. It was like a candy bar. Oh, well, you know, no, no, we don't eat candy bars. You gotta understand, we don't eat candy bars. We don't eat things with sugar. This has no sugar in it. You know, so it's not, it, but, it, but it was better than any candy bar I've ever had in my life. And I ate it. And then I put the box up on the shelf. Now that was, that was a, a week ago, and I'm patting myself on the back. Because the temptation to go in and get, well, another one, just one more, you know, matched with the thing that at some point, because Donna won't, she'll eat one a week maybe, but there's going to be a week when she goes in and says, the box is empty. Where did it all go? You know, it's like, and I'm going to get caught. So there's no way I can sneak the bars, you know, because... But, but it was this instant recognition that, that, you know, Don, this is an opportunity for discipline. <laughs> Self-discipline. So I'm, I'm reporting to, to Jordan and mom's watching. So I, I'm reporting that I have disciplined myself and haven't eaten the whole box. You know, yeah, that's true. But, but, it, it, but, it, but it could very easily become addictive. It could be. Absolutely, a good thing can become addictive, you know. And on check, I have no problem seeing that this body would be very happy if I gave it three bars a day every day for a month, you know. Because yeah. <laughs> they're good. At some point, you might say, ah, but what's my point? My point is this everything in the house is mine. She bought it, but everything in the house is mine. Everything in the house is hers. Okay? But everything that is mine is not to be appropriated without discipline. Everything the Father has is yours. Doesn't mean you're going to go down to the Cadillac dealer tomorrow and say, that's my Cadillac, I want it, drive it out. Or, I can borrow the money for it, now you're in debt you know, up to your head because you, you wanted a status. God wants you to have fine things too, but there's got to be discipline in the family. Hmm? I, I'm sure the younger son could have had a fatted calf and had a feast with his friends. If, however, every night he was having a fatted calf and feasting with his friends every night, I think the father at some point might say, I think you are letting that control you. Is this making some sense to you? So, so what's the point of the message today? The point of the message today is this. That with your heart you believe, but with your mouth you are speaking. And when you're speaking negativity, when you're speaking, I've served, I've done all this, nobody appreciates me, nobody cares for me. When, you, when that starts coming out of your mouth, you realize you're in deep trouble. And you know, God's not mad at you. But God is also not moved by you. And so the father left the elder son standing outside, bitterly complaining 
And the father went in and rejoiced and celebrated. The party's going on. The party of life. The goodness of the kingdom of God. Those of us who are learning to walk in the joy of the Lord and be happy. You know what? We're still going to be happy. And if you're grouchy and down and depressed and want us to leave our party and come sit with you, the answer is no. You can make a choice and get out of your sorry self and come participate in the party. Or you can sit there and grouse and complain and then get mad at us, by the way, because we're having a party and it's not fair because you're in misery. There's no way you can rejoice. One last story, I think. Norman Cousins wrote a book, you've heard me talk about it, The Anatomy of Hope. Uh, he's the one that went to UCLA. Uh, he was there for over 10 years doing a study that, that physiologically we know that if stressful negative things come in your life, they literally change the biochemistry of your body. Things we can look in a microscope, we can test in a tube, we know that literally stress and negativity impact your biology. And his approach is, well, then why can't we find out that positive things and laughter and good things will literally change your biochemistry? And while medicine believed the negative part of it, they didn't believe the positive part of it, and he went there and proved it. At UCLA, they have a whole branch of medicine that looks at that now. That literally, you literally, endorphins are changing, brain connections, and now we have Carolyn Leaf coming along and teaching us. Literally, you're literally changing your biochemistry. He was called by a friend of his to uh, come visit a judge who had terminal cancer. And the judge was always positive, always uh, excited about life, and always humorous, and always had things to say. And once he, he had this assessment, and, and it looked like he was within um, months maybe of dying, uh, he turned totally negative. And his wife and children were devastated by what happened to him. Not physically, but what had happened to him. He no longer laughed. He no longer was a quick wit, quit, quick wit. You know, and, and so the psychiatrist called Norman Cousin and said, can you come talk to the judge? I don't think he knows what he's doing to his family. Norman goes to visit him, and Norman knows, you know, you can change the atmosphere, and, 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 and that, that just because that's the, the, uh, the verdict doesn't mean it's the conclusion. Norman knows all that, but as he talked with the judge, he realized the judge wasn't going to go down that road. The, the judge wasn't going to say, I'm going to fight and win this. And so what he said to the judge was, you have a right to make your own decisions about your life, but you have no right to do what you're doing to your family. And he said, the judge sitting in bed just stopped and stared at him and said, I understand what you're saying. Norman left. He had to travel over to, I think it was Australia at the time. And so he was gone for several weeks. And uh, it was like four or five weeks later, he was finally able to uh, get back in touch with a psychiatrist and find out, so, so what's happening with this judge? He says, you know, it's a miracle. He said... And the miracle isn't what you, you think. His, his disease is still on the track of what it was. But the very next day after you visit him, he changed his entire attitude with his family. He says, I go in there now and they're laughing. They're joking. They come in and say things and he's the quick wit, quick wit that he always was. The man changed because of his impact on others. It would have been a great story if you said, okay, in the end of the story, he was healed and all that. He wasn't. He wasn't. His decision. But he made a decision to realize that he had no right to destroy the lives of others because of what he was going through. If you are a Christian, you have absolutely no right to be messing up other people's lives because you won't deal with what God tells you to deal with. You have no right to mess up your marriage. You have no right to mess up your children. 
You have no right to mess up other people in the body of Christ. You have no right to walk into the family gathering looking down and depressed and discouraged, just begging, pay attention to me, pay attention. Can't you see? I'm, I'm having a pity party today. Can't you see? You have no right to do that. If you're a Christian, you have a responsibility to others. You put your best face on, and you put your best faith on. And if you're struggling with it on the inside, on the outside you represent your Lord to the best of everything you know you can be. When you go into the workplace as a Christian, you have no rights for you. You're representing the king of kings. To walk into work, to, oh, I'm tired, I'm discouraged, or I'm doing my work, whatever I'm doing. But you know, everybody knows, well, he's having an attitude today. You're a representative of the king of kings. Get out of yourself. And you're going to find an interesting thing. When you get out of yourself, and you start doing what you need to do because that's who you are, the more you do that, the more you actually become that. And pretty soon you go into work, and a negative thing happens, and you brush it off, not because you have to, not because you remember pastor saying you have no right to do that, but it has become you. You now look at life that way. And if you get knocked down, you're like the weebles. You keep coming back up. As one of the paraphrases says of Timothy, you may be knocked down, but you're never knocked out. Come on. You keep getting back up and going at it again and again. That's a decision you can make. Now, here's the thing. I say it, I teach it, and you think, well, pastor's demanding it, and pastor thinks we ought to live this way. It's not about that at all. It's about you. Because when you hurt, I hurt. When your life is failing, I don't just say, well, you made your bad lie in it. That hurts. When you make decisions that cause your life to unravel and fall apart, of course that hurts. It's not for me. I'm okay. You're not. And young people, when I talk about changing attitudes, because that's going to follow you through your life. I don't care if you like me, I want you to listen to what I'm saying, because you set in motion things at 16, 26, 30 years old, and at 60 years old you're locked into a worldview that is very unhappy. But you can change it. So when words come into you from the Word of God and from those around you, you don't get upset. You know, well, they're criticizing me, right? God is doing what he did here. He's pleading with the elder brother, look, drop it. Come into the celebration. Change your way of thinking. Quit thinking it's about you and what you do and become part of the family of God. It's an open invitation. And I'm here as a younger brother to tell you, God had a party for me. And I'm glad he did. And I want to tell you, if you're an older brother, come on into the party. God, your Father, loves you, has great compassion, and wants you to know that all that he has is yours. Did you get anything out of this today? Father, we thank you and praise you for your love. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering words to us today. I, I trust they were words of life to all of us. Uh, I know they were encouraging to me. I know there's things that I need to change. I know there's things all of us need to change. That's between us and you, Abba. What needs to change is what you bring to us only for one reason. Not so we keep an angry God off our back, but so we allow your compassion, your grace, your love to flow freely through our life. Oh, how much, Abba, you want to bless us beyond our wildest imaginations, and, and we by our attitudes have interfered with it. May this be a new day for us. May this be a day when Holy Spirit has a new uh, openness in us, uh, another avenue by which he can bring into our life an awareness of whose we are, to be grateful for what we have, that we truly might be the joy-filled sons and daughters of the Most High God. And everybody in agreement said... Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Holy One of Israel continue to pour out His compassion and grace in your life. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, your God, my God, our Father, 
richly bring us into the fullness of the family. May we not resist, but with wholehearted joy, enter his presence with thanksgiving for who he is and who he's called us to be. May we all be empowered to live the life of a son and daughter of God. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm sure glad I was here today.